we get a lot of help from uh, some sponsorships and funding sources, particularly the North Central Soybean, Soybean Research Program. Uh, many of us get additional funding from state soybean commodity boards, and we really appreciate that. It helps fund research and gives us some people power to collect data. We also get some funding from the North Central Soybean IPM Center and the USDA. Um, in addition, we also get a lot of support from industry for chemical seed and a lot of other resources, which we appreciate. And then we just piecemeal a lot of other types of funding from state, federal, and other types of funding sources. So it takes a lot of dollars to make all this research and extension possible. Uh, I think almost everyone on the panel today works with farmers directly, and they let us do some kind of crazy stuff on their farms. And so we really appreciate that because sometimes we set up some unusual experiments to make things um, happen for research. And so we wanna thank all the farmers who let us work on their, on their land. And um, as, as the title of the webinar said, this is a discussion. We're hoping to have kind of short bursts of research updates and then have some Q and A. And so we're gonna try and facilitate that the best we can, although there's going to be a lot of people attending our webinar today. So we're gonna try and um, sort of collate those questions um, and follow-ups. And so we're gonna take some breaks in between to try and, and answer those questions, but also reserve a lot of time at the end until basically you guys get exhausted of our questions. So we're, we're gonna keep on for maybe as long as an hour and a half, but hoping to wrap up our research updates within, within the first hour. So if you have a question, you can look at the bottom of your Zoom and you'll see a Q&A button. That is the place for you to ask a, a question about research or uh, something specific about midge biology, ecology, management. Um, know that if you type in a question in the Q&A, only the panelists can see it, not everybody can see it. And so uh, we'll, we'll try and read those back to you guys the best we can and not knowing how many questions we'll get. Um, we'll keep a catalog of all the questions and the responses and We'll post that sort of as a FAQ on our website at the end so you can kind of see what other people are asking. If you have a technical issue, like you're not hearing us, you're not seeing us, you're having trouble um, with, with um, any part of the Zoom, that's when you can use the chat feature. It's also a button at the bottom of your Zoom. So you can type in there if you have any questions about CEUs or, or CCA credits, you can type it in there. But we're hoping to keep the more biology past questions on the Q&A box. Uh, we do offer CCA CEUs today, um, and we're gonna provide a Google link at the very end so that you can sign up, um, but we'll also post a QR code just like last week. So if you'd rather scan the QR code, you could do it that way, it's a little bit faster. Um, we are recording these sessions. And so if you want to watch them again, tell your colleagues, your friends, your family, so they can see the sessions, not only the, the two that we're doing this year, but we did three last year. They're gonna be posted on our soybeangalmage.org website with, with closed captioning. So um, they should be ready to go in early March. And so uh, look forward to that. And then uh, we're also going to be sending you an evaluation of our, of our webinars last week and this week, um, just to show you know if you had interest, if you learned something, um, any type of feedback, we'd be glad to take that. So. Okay, I think I've said enough. Uh, we will get moving on to our first presentation by Dr. Justin McMechan at the University of Nebraska talking about some cultural control, control strategies. Go ahead, Justin. Great, thanks, Aaron. Uh, you, all right. Um, so I'm gonna kick off today's session realizing some of you have probably come into this conversation maybe not seeing the first session. So I'm gonna spend just a couple slides uh, briefly highlighting as we go through these cultural control strategies, what, what kind of the goal is in terms of how we, how we view them. Um, so uh, if, if we remember, and, and you know, after the video is posted, certainly go back and look at those, those, uh, that session one, but Galmage is overwintering in last year's soybean field. Uh, we, we covered its distribution of the soil um, and the insect emerges in the, the spring and we've documented dates of emergence. And the challenge we faced as we transitioned to management in the first session and through this session uh, with a large number of tactics is the duration that this insect emerges for. So the longer it emerges from those overwintering sites, and you can see that trend from 2019 to 2020 to 2021, or up to 36 days, that, that poses a significant challenge in terms of, of what types of strategies we use. And then lastly, before we start getting into all this discussion 
uh, of, of uh, the various topics is, is that, you know, we're really targeting the overwintering populations movement into soybeans and controlling them as they get in uh, with a lot of our strategies. Some, some are gonna be an exception to that. So um, obviously the title is, is to look at hilling. And, and in order to start the conversation on hilling, I think it's important to recognize that, that this is an important strategy or, or uh, value because of its relevance to the uh, location and occurrence of soybean gallmage and where it can infest the plant. And so this image should be burned into your memory at this point that at the base of these plants, the V2 stage is where these small cracks or fissures start to form. And without any other injury sources, this appears to be the only place that we really find soybean gallmage infesting early in the season where we can find those larvae. So ultimately through a field survey, uh, we came across some, some sites that were hilled um, or ridge tilled. And I'm gonna define those two very, very clearly for you because they, they have an important distinguishing feature between the two of them, but that's what led to this, this study we'll discuss. So we'll start with what is you know, normal, what we typically see in a soybean field, which is uh, a soybean plant that is not hilled and that open and exposed below the cotyledonary node area where soybean gallmage can infest. Um, and, and the difference in question is, is what if we pull soil up around the base of that plant? So you can see those two arrows pulling soil from between the rows, as is in the image here with Joanna Schroeder D'Souza, who, who uh, was uh, helping us with this project this past year, but pulling that soil from that center row up around and covering that area where soybean gallmage uh, would potentially uh, infest the plant. Um, and so th this is ultimately the two treatments we have. We have, we have no hilling, um, you know, and we have that open access, and then we have that closed up plant. Before we go ahead, I, a, a lot of people I think have had significant questions about ridge tillage versus hilling. Um, and so hopefully this diagram illustrates ridge tillage, you can create a ridge and plant on the top of that ridge. And essentially that little open area where gallmage can get in can still be present. Now, if a lot of people will re-ridge these fields and possibly they cover through the re-ridging process, that would occur at a different point in the season. But compared to hilling, we're talking about early in the season, actually covering up that, that area at the base of the plant. Um, you know, in, in a way that we've, we've planted at a level service and added soil versus planting on the top of a ridge. So we're aiming for hilling, not for ridge tillage, at least for the study and how it was conducted. And if that's not clear, ask, ask lots of questions and, and, uh, in the Q&A and when we will we'll cover that in as much detail. So this, this study was done in three different sites in, in, uh, in Nebraska and Cass, Lancaster and Odo County. We timed the, the application of hilling to be at the V2 to V3 stage. This is a visual representation uh, of that that you can see above and then below are the actual photos. So you see that open and exposed area below the cotyledonary node. And then you see with the, the, the hilling that we've covered up that space. Uh, and this is a nail biter to do when plants are this small because we're really just leaving a small part of that plant poking out the top. So what we've done, and I, I'm going to pair this, You're, you've got two things on, on your screen right now. You've got uh, infested plants and you've got uh, two rows of soybeans because these were two row plots. And I, I want to describe how we got to that data. Uh, with those two row plots, we were pulling 10 plants from each row. And then we were looking at those for the number of plants that were infested. So we were peeling back tissue, determining the number of plants. And as a result, uh, for the average across the four reps that we had at each site or up to eight reps, we came up with this graph here. Uh, really don't need statistics to show this. It's the three different sites here on the bottom. Uh, they're represented by the cities and locations. You might be familiar with you from the uh, emergence network. On the y-axis is the percentage of infested plants. The number of little asterisks that are up here just means how big the difference is. The more asterisks there are, the bigger that difference is. And you could see at, at Eagle, we didn't even have uh, any infestation on the hill plots, whereas Prairie Home in Syracuse, we have low levels of infestation uh, and, you know, for, for what is hilled and for what is not hilled, higher, higher levels of infestation, all were significantly different. We were able to reduce the percentage of infested plants uh, with hilling. And then for larval count, you can imagine taking those four plants that were infested and taking three of those and counting them for larval number. How many larvae are present on those plants? Uh, and this is the number per uh, plant, number of larvae per plant. And you could see that, you know, on those no hill treatments, we have more white, uh, orange, and then total larvae. This is just the, the total of these two. Uh, and, and obviously across all the, the, the three sites that you see, wherever we hilled, we got a reduction uh, in, in the number of larvae per plant uh, with that hilling treatment. So 
Um, you know, not not a not a crazy tactic, but, uh, pretty archaic, but but pretty effective. And now, if we look at at AUSPC, you know, this is the the Helton et al. 2022 paper that'll hopefully be coming out pretty pretty soon, where he described. Um, you know, that, that AUSPC calculations relation to yield, you're going to see a strong relation to yield in this study as well. Um, you could see that the lower score would be a nice green plot. The higher score would be a lot of dead plants um, represented here, you know, that not hill treatment. And you can see all the, the no hill treatments have much higher injury scores versus hilled, you know, much lower scores. Um, so, so very strong reflection to less injury in those plants. Now, one thing that's important to note is we got injury in the hilling treatments. So, so it's possible the soil washes away, exposes the base of those plants and they can become infested. And then uh, of course, yield here, a nice photo from Elliot Knoll taken with the UAV that shows you know, where we, we had hailing, there's just those little green patches that are left uh, and because it's a very high pressure site, significant differences in yield uh, for all three sites. Uh, lowest pressure site was Eagle, but regardless, large differences uh, with, with hilling having significantly higher yields than, than the no-hill treatments. So, so to summarize, hilling appears to be an effective strategy for reducing infestation and plant injury. Uh, we all realize this is not a practical strategy for a lot of you to use, uh, but it's a really useful tool for understanding the susceptibility of soybeans and for providing that check in the field for in the absence maybe or, or significant reduction in in soybean gallmage infestation, what does that look like? And how does that understand the yield impacts of this insect? Uh, we don't know adult behavior. So if you are one of those few that could use this, be cautious. If we hill the edges of those fields, we don't know how this insect re would respond. It might move past those areas. We won't know that till we have another year's research. Uh, what it does reinforce is that it, it, it highlights the need to target that area where the fissures occur. So, so if the insect doesn't have uh, access to that, you know, that, that significantly uh, impacts uh, or reduces the, the potential for infestation. Um, we're going to transition now to, to some other practices that, that impact fissure availability or the timing of that availability. And so I'm going to hand it off. I, I guess maybe we'll have a minute or two for questions, Aaron, but we'll hand it off to Natasha afterwards. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, we had one question that isn't exactly related to healing, but uh, someone asked about growing continuous corn. And is that perhaps an effective strategy for reducing midge populations in, in a local area? Mm. Well, yeah, I, I guess I'll start answering the other answer. It's, it's pretty clear that uh, in the absence of the host that the, the insect could diminish in population. And, and we have data to support uh, that, that this insect doesn't overwinter for more than one season. Now that's not an extensive data set, but enough to feel confident. Um, and so continuous corn could lower population. I think you'd want to talk to your corn entomologist that might tell you that's, that's not a good idea. And maybe I'll pass it off to somebody to explain. We all know, but why is that a, that a bad idea? <laughs> yeah, uh, that sounds good. Maybe one more question. Um, in addition to hilling with soil, um, have you had any observations or experience using other types of ground cover as maybe a deterrent, um, like mulch or other types of vegetation? Oh man, good question. Like the first one that comes to mind is cover crops, right? So if we have this really extensive cover crop growth and plant soybeans in it, does it hide from soybean gallmage, essentially like those adults moving over? Uh, I, I certainly don't have the answer to that. Uh, it's, a, it's a logical idea from, from what, what you see. Uh, the trouble is, is, is that that stem, although hidden, is still exposed. So, so I don't think it would be necessarily considered definitive, uh, but uh, it, it would be worth testing, um, you know, at some point in the future to see. And, and I think we we're missing all the components of how does Gallmage find these plants after it emerges? Is it chemical cues? Is it visual cues? Is it a combination? Knowing that, you know, even if the plant's hidden, but it gives off a chemical cue, that, that, you know, cover crop may not hide it uh, as an example. So we, we just don't know. Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, Justin, are you ready to move on? Or I should say, is, is Natasha ready to move on? If you could pull up your slides, I think we'll transition to Natasha. She's gonna be talking a little bit uh, more about how planting dates might impact soybean gallmage. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Omizu. 
I'm a master's student at the Department of Entomology at UNL. And as Dr. Jess McNick already mentioned, uh, now I'm gonna talk about my research that is related to planting date and seed treatment. But before I go deeper in, into my uh, research, uh, first, I would like to talk about one topic that is, will be important for our discussion uh, later. So this topic is about planting date. Uh, so we know that depending on when we plant our, our soil bean, we can have a different yield in the end of the, the season. Uh, and then, so the most important question is when is the best time to plant our, our soil bean? So it should be in the early season or late season. And we know that when we plant early, that is between the end of April to beginning of May, uh, the plant can have more sunlight. That will be the energy for the development of the plant. And besides that, we can have um, a canop closure earlier. So this will help to avoid the water evaporation in the soil. And those uh, factors can help to have a better yield in the end of the season, right? So why I brought this topic here uh, is because during my presentation, I would like to have in mind that this can be different when we have soybean gold in the field because we are gonna have a different factor in this scenario. So since the planting date and, uh, is an important talk and we are still looking for some effective management for this new species, uh, my research, well, the objective of my research was to evaluate different planting date combined with seed treatment as a management to control soybean gummage. So my study was conducted at Lancaster County that is located in Nebraska. And in the site where we did our, uh, my research, uh, the first time that we reported the soybean gold mage was in 2018. So in my study, uh, we had five different planting dates and starting on April 22nd, uh, May 2nd, and then May 12th, May 22nd, and the last one was in June 1st. And on right, you can see how the study was designed. So we had five repetition, and in each repetition, we uh, randomly distributed the, the planting date. And besides the planting date, we evaluate the seed treatment as well. So in each plot, we split in gaucho and non gaucho so for the data collection, we had three different dates. Uh, so our first collection was in June 18. Uh, the second collection was in June 28th. And the third collection was in July 8th. So the data collection that we did was the same as was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. So we tracked the overwinter emergency. Uh, we, we checked the number of infested plant, the number of larvae per plant, injury score, and yield. So since uh, Dr. Jess McMicken already explained this methodology, I'm gonna skip this part, but if you have any question or if you, you didn't see the presentation before, you can access the video in your website or just put in the comments and then we can talk about this later. So in the site where I, we did the research, the first uh, adult overwintering emergency was in June 5th. So, and it lasted for 42 days until July 17th. So the duration of the emergency is important for this study because we are looking for different planting date. And so in our first data collection that was in June 18th, for our frequency of infested plant, we could not find any plants infested in the field. Uh, but even that, we brought some uh, plants to the lab for larvae count. And then moving for the second uh, data collection. Uh, so after 10 days, uh, we, we went after 10 days uh, from our first emergency adult, we went to the field and collected uh, some plants. And as we could see here in the results, 
So for soil being that was planted on May 22nd without uh, seed treatment, we could have less infested plant comparing to the others. And then again, after 10 days, we went back to the field and collected our uh, last data collection. And in this time, we could find uh, infested plant in every planting date. But for our soybean that was planted um, in the late of season, we could find less infested plants comparing to soil bean that was planted uh, earlier. And now I'm going to move for uh, how many larvae we found per plant. So as I mentioned before, in our first data collection, we could not find uh, infested plant in the field, but then we brought some uh, plants to the lab. And then in, in the lab, we could find some larvae. So for soil bean that was planted on April 22nd and without uh, seed treatment, we could find more larvae. But uh, the number of larvae was still really low, as you can see in the graph. And then in the second data collection, um, we could find larvae in almost every planting date. Just in June 1st, we could not find any larvae. And for soil bean that was planted earlier, uh, we could find more larvae comparing to the soil bean that was planted on May 22nd. And moving to the last data collection. Uh, so in this time we found larvae in all planting date, but for the planting, uh, for the soil bean that was planted on June 1st, we, we found less larvae comparing to the others. And one thing that I would like to bring here is about the uh, soybean stage growth. So as Dr. Jess McMicken uh, explained before, uh, when we, we have the soybean in V2, we start to have the future in the base of the stem. So this can make the plant more susceptible for the infestation, right? And if you can see in my graphs, so when we had a uh, soybean in V2, V1, V2, and V3, uh, we could not find larvae in this moment. So uh, we believe that this, this time uh, is when the insect starts to infest the plants. And during the season, we evaluated the injury. And here in the left, you can see some photos related to how we score the injury. So in the base, uh, was in a low score. And then if you go move, if you move to the top, you can see a very high uh, injury score. So for seed treatment, uh, uh, plants with gaucho, we could see less, uh, less plant with injury. And for planting date, uh, soil being planted on June 1st uh, was with less injury as well, as we can see here in this photo. So uh, on the left, we have soil being planted on May 12th. And right to the next, we have the uh, soil being planted in June 1st. So here is really clear that we can see the difference between injury and between uh, planting dates. So the last result that we I, I want to discuss is about the yield that is the most important. So in, uh, for soil bean that was planted in June 1st, uh, we could have a better yield comparing to soil bean that was planted on May 2nd and May 12th. But you can see here that uh, even when we planted earlier, that was in April 22nd, the yield was compared to soil bean that was planted late. But one thing that I would like to point here is if you remember the last uh, graph that I showed you, in this uh, planting date, uh, we had more larvae per plant. So this can uh, reflect to the next uh, season. So this can result probably in more infestation for the, the, the future um, year. So just to conclude here, um, what we could see in the last season is that 
for soybean that was planted earlier, that was between April 22nd and May 12th, uh, we could find more larvae per plant. And, and between the three, the, those three planting dates, the uh, soybean that was planted in May 2nd and May 12th could result in more susceptible, could be more susceptible for being fasted because the soybean stage that was in V2 uh, during the adult overwinter emergency. And about the seed treatment, uh, for, so for, me stu for my study, uh, we did not see any difference between uh, planting date. But now uh, do Dr. Jess McMicken here gonna talk about another uh, study that we did that is related to planting date and seed treatment in four different sites. So thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Natasha. That was great. Um, we had a couple of questions related to planting date and um, maybe Natasha or Justin could um, recap that for us. Um, do you think that there would be an advantage to having, or do you think there's a plant advantage to being larger or more mature as far as being able to withstand injury from the midge? Is a, is a bigger, older plant better? Yeah, I, I don't know if I, I can, I can take a stab at it, Natasha, that these are, these are good questions, really good questions. Um, from observation, and, and this is not the, like Natasha's doing the most detailed data set, we've done this study before, um, there's, there's an indication that a larger plant, and I just think generally, as we understand soybean gall midge and, and insect feeding, if a plant's bigger, it can probably withstand a little more feeding, um, would, would be, uh, would be a, a good way of thinking about this. Um, I, I don't know, there, there's a tricky dynamic there on, on how hard those plants get hit. So, so we planned earlier and a, and a greater proportion of that population lands on those plants, right. And is successful because they're susceptible um, it, it's, it's tricky, but, but that, that U shape suggests that, that one reasonable explanation is, is plant development is further along and thus a larger plant. And, and as a result, it's, it's able to take more impact, uh, from that. That's, that's a roundabout way of getting to the, the rough answer. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. Um, I think you're up next. You're talking about thyma and maybe a, some different planting dates. So if you want to queue up your slides, we had a couple more questions related to planting date, but I think we will push those to the end just to keep things moving along. So let's see, Justin, I can see your preview slide. There you go. You're ready. Okay. Um, so yeah, Natasha did a really nice job with, with a lot of planting dates of, of explaining it at a single site. What the response is, and I think a number of us would would wonder how stable that might be across a range of sites where we see variation in in adult emergence and timing. And so, uh, with with thymet showing potential in 2020, we pursued it with planning date um, as as a understanding to its role with with uh, with planning date uh, in 2021. So, really simple study design here, four sites. Uh, all, uh, you know, Cass, Saunders, Lancaster, Noto County, uh, three planning dates within each planning date, we put on the, the max labeled rate for, for thymet at nine ounces per thousand feet, a uh, thousand foot row. Uh, so that with or without treatment, you can see that in that, that experimental design that's there. That's, that's just along the field edge. We, we did four reps at each site. I'm not going to belabor all the, the, the data we took. I'm going to focus on two because I think they highlight, uh, you know, the understanding that we have to get to with soybean gallmage and, and planting date. So, so for a number of you, thymet may not be accessible because of the cost of, of the equipment um, or, or, or other means. So untreated is a, is a really valuable way of looking at the response of this across a number of sites. So, so lots of graphs. This is like, oh man, okay, please, please take time on this slide so I can digest all these graphs. Okay, so all of these sites, there are four sites here uh, they're all arranged. Uh, why I did this and why I put all these on, this, on the same slide is the response is nearly the same at every site. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background and then we'll highlight that similar response. Um, all graphs on the x-axis have the planning dates, the actual planning date at that site. All of the y-axis that goes up and down is the number of larvae per six plants. And then what I just added here is the first date of adult, adult emergence at each site. 
and that duration. And so you see a little bit of variation in duration and timing of emergence. Uh, but regardless of those variations, look, look at the response. As we look across every planning day for the untreated, that's that line that's being drawn across, larval number is always highest in the first two planning dates. Early, either late, you know, late April, early May through mid-May, all the numbers are high and they all drop with that late planting date. And so, yes, in, in some cases, as you see, uh, thymate reduced larval number. Uh, it, it was primarily to be significant. It was held to the later planting date. So significant difference here on the 23rd, uh, another one here on May 8th, uh, and then another one here on May 13th. But, but if you really look, planting date is carrying the majority of the weight in reducing larval number uh, on, on these treatments. Okay, and what you all carry about is, is yield. And what does yield say in, in this scenario? So untreated plots had lower yields for the early planning dates. So, so this makes sense. This matches what Natasha just told us, which is you know, the early planning dates have a greater uh, potential for infestation, thus injury and yield loss. This was the highest pressure site, lower yields in the first two planning dates, increasing in the late planning date. It's a similar trend for all the sites. In fact, I'll add that little line to show you. Uh, lowest yields are in the earliest plantings. They increase that, that dip in the center like Natasha saw is the same for these two. You know that if you align V2 stage as an, as an understanding with significant adult emergence, then you, you have the smallest plant uh, in the system hit with possibly the greatest amount of, of infestation potential. As a result, we expect those plants to get hit hard. Um, surprisingly, thymate held pretty well across these planting dates. Again, not, not an accessible strategy to a lot of us. Um, I was surprised to see this. It would be interesting to see this across years. You do see still increases as you move to later planting dates, not significant, uh, but uh, certainly in a lot of cases, that latest planting date is, is got the highest yield. Uh, counterintuitive to the thoughts on the agronomic uh, side of this. Okay, so that's quick. I didn't, I didn't need to belabor that. I, I wanted to reinforce the points of, in particular, planting date. I, I know a sore subject to discuss. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it shows that we could reduce larval number. And there are a few things coming out of this. Significant impact from planning date, regardless of the duration or timing of adult emergence. These are long emergence numbers that, that we see, the longest in the network uh, that's been measured. Uh, what's the impact on planning date on seasonal larval abundance? I think between Natasha's data and what you just saw here, you know, what is, what is the end of season effect for the larval load, the number of larvae that are going to be overwintering in that field? And what does that mean for next year? Are we are we carrying the problem through with early planning dates? That's a question, not a not a an, an assumption, but but something that needs to be looked at. Uh, you know, we really need to get to a comparison with grower fields. If you're in particular in East Central Nebraska, we're running these studies, and others, if they're interested, we want to get to those late planted fields that are a whole field late planted and see what the relationship is there, because we have this small plots that things can move between uh, and potentially infest. Um, and then, you know, integrating other tactics we haven't tested yet, but have discussed as a group is what, what's the role in late planting dates or planting date with foliar applications? Is there some combination there? We didn't see effect with those, those earlier plantings. Is this something worth exploring, um, you know, for high risk growers or for, for ourselves as, as researchers? So uh, with that, um, I'll toss it back to Aaron. Thanks, Justin. We've had a lot of good agronomic type questions come in uh, related to, to data planting. And I, I hope I'm phrasing this the way that the person intended, but you know what, with planting super early, maybe even like mid April, uh, the yield benefit to doing that, would that sort of outweigh maybe some of the effects that you'd see with soybean gall midge, um, you know, the field interior yield kind of blending out some of the things you'd see at the edge? Yeah. Oh man. Okay. April 10th planting. Whew, that's, that's early. <laughs> Uh, I think it's at April 15th. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's lots to consider. You know, we, we're, if, if we take our entomology hat off and we put our agronomy hat on for a second, uh, insurance dates for plantings are, are later than that because of the risk of frost. So, so you as a grower, I'm not going to tell you, weigh your risk of, of risk of frost. Uh, corn can emerge and get, get, you know, beat back by frost and come up again because the growing points below the ground. Soybean, it's immediately above the ground. 98% of you already know that, but I got to reinforce that when you're talking about that early of a planting. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm ambitious enough to test that. Uh, and I don't have an answer for you without testing that uh, to, to know 
yeah. what that would mean. Uh, good, okay. good question. Um, do you think that thiamate could be also suppressing other pests that might be in the soil in addition I, to soybean gallmage? Ab absolutely. I mean, I, I, that'd be ridiculous not to suggest it's just impacting soybean gallmage. We're, we're assuming with a lot of this that it is the main factor that's out there, but, but absolutely. I mean, it, it, is, it is not selective to soybean gallmage. We all know that. Um, so, so some of that yield could be in response to that uh, as well. Okay, maybe one more question before we move on. Um, besides uh, thymet, have you looked at other insecticidal seed treatments? We've looked at a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, I would, when the recording becomes available for the last one, go back to, to that one. Uh, we, we've tested a lot of stuff. Maybe at the end, we can, we got specific questions. We can rehash some of those on various chemistries that were tested. Okay, thanks, Justin. Um, we will move on to the next, which is myself. I hope you guys can all see my slides um, and hear me okay. Um, myself, I, again, I'm Erin Hodson, along with Justin, we co-advise a graduate student, Ben Colby here at Iowa State. He's in class right now and he's taking a test right now. So wish him all luck. He might be able to join us a little bit later, but uh, I'm gonna be highlighting some of his research. And so uh, if you remember from last week and previous discussions about how we collect adults, uh, we, um, we use their biology. So uh, as the larvae are nearing complete development, they get really wiggly and drop from the plant and try and work their way down into the soil to pupate. And we catch the adults as they're coming out of the ground with these rootworm cages. And they look sort of old school and that's because they're handcrafted uh, by labs all, all over entomology departments. And if you also remember, we've been putting these traps everywhere and basically they, most of them are overwintering in soybean fields. And so we put those cages in soybean fields and then monitor them um, for adult emergence. But because likely corn is planted the next year, oftentimes we are sampling with those rootworm cages in, in corn fields. And if you remember, most of the larvae, the pre pupae are at the very top of the soil surface. So one, one and a half inches. So they're really close to the top. And so, and then it's probably no surprise, I think about 60% of row crop farmers in the US use some form of tillage. And they think about tillage for altering soil habitats and moisture compaction and erosion, but it's also been used to uh, think about for pest management as well. And so there's uh, quite a bit of research out there that talks about using tillage, all kinds of tillage, a tillage timing to help or hurt pests, and also in some cases, some natural enemies. And so we were thinking about using tillage to cause physical or mechanical damage. So that, you know, killing the midges or just moving them around in the soil profile. So pushing them deeper in the soil than they'd probably like to be, or maybe bringing them right to the soil surface where they could be uh, desiccated or uh, predators or other access where it causes mortality. And then I think it's been shown that some forms of tillage can cause the soil temperatures to warm up faster than no-till. And so the, the simple act of having a warmer soil where the midges are um, will cause the midges to develop faster. Remember, they will develop to adult based on accumulating heat or heat units. And so if they warm up faster and they emerge before a suitable host is ready, could that maybe impact their success as well? And so we had a tillage experiment in Iowa and North Dakota, sorry, Iowa and Nebraska in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we didn't have good luck in Iowa. We picked a location where we captured zero adults. And so the data I'm showing is just from Nebraska where they had two pair treatments, a fall tillage versus a no-till and then a fall and spring tillage treatment versus a no-till. And they set up these rootworm cages and monitored for adults from the beginning of June to July 21st. And they would uh, look at those jars every other day. And so what we we're looking for is first emergence, peak emergence and cumulative emergence. So the total number of adults coming out from each trap. And then uh, we also took information about the sex. So we noted males and females uh, for each treatment as well. So this is just another way to look at it. The calendar is on the bottom. And, and our best guess is that they have three overlapping generations every year. They overwinter as pre-pupa, very close to the soil surface. And so what we're doing again is we're monitoring currently growing cornfields, knowing that they were uh, soybean fields infested with midges the previous year. And so monitoring for about six or seven weeks, trying to catch adults coming out of the ground. 
So this is the data that uh, Ben has summarized uh, by sex for each treatment. So the males are solid bars and the females are in the dotted bars uh, for each treatment. And um, it's, I want you to take note of the scale. It's very low numbers. Although Iowa captured nothing, Nebraska had some pretty low adult captures in this location. And general summaries are males emerge first, and that's very typical for almost all insects as the males will come out before the females. The ratios were pretty close to 50-50 in all treatments. And we did not detect any type of emergence patterns or any difference between the paired treatments. So for first emergence, peak emergence, or cumulative emergence. But we're gonna keep trying because we do think that uh, because of where they're put in the soil and just the nature of having to move back and forth between uh, fields every year as they kind of chase down soybean fields, uh, we are looking at doing this again. Ben's already put some fall tillage treatments at, in Western Iowa. We're gonna bump up the number of treatments. So it's gonna be a fall, a spring, a fall and spring, and then an untreated or no-till treatment. We're increasing our sample size, just trying to improve the odds of finding more adults on those. And you can see on those pictures that Ben took, we're doing the tillage treatment right along the field edge where we feel like it's most likely to find midges. And then we're also looking at a couple, couple different types of tillage, uh, knowing that there's quite a bit of variability um, which a farmer might have access to. And so a lot of people help with this, uh, at monitoring those jars. Setting up those plots takes a lot of work. So thank you everybody at Nebraska for helping us out. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, let's see if anything kind of came in as I was talking. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Any questions specifically related to tillage? We've had a couple different questions come in about different types of tillage. I think it's be, it would be too early to tell like strip till or some of the reduced tillage compared to more um, aggressive types of tillage. I don't think we have a strong data set on that yet. Aaron, this is a question that I've yeah. gotten on occasion from people. You know, they're looking at this, this last winter, depending on where you are, and the winter's been open or, or a lot of snowfall this time. I wonder what this would look like depending on the winter we have for those fall tillage treatments mm -hmm. uh, open and exposed versus snow covered. Yeah, we were kind of talking about that before the webinar got, got started. We have a lot of open areas. And so we don't have typically the snow cover that we might have in the past few winters. Um, and it does make those soil dwelling insects more exposed, especially if you're close to the soil surface. So um, I don't think we'll talk about it today, but we have interest to know, or we're interested to know like how cold would it have to be um, for, you know, like air temperatures to kill a soybean gall midge. We don't know that, but I think we're interested in that. But I think that would definitely play a part if, if, the, if you don't have any residue or you don't have any snow cover you know, what that might mean for exposure to the, to the midges or just how those areas are gonna warm up in the spring. Um, we don't have real solid answers for that. Do we keep saying that over and over again, Justin? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, not sure if anything else has come up. Um, um, someone asked about three generations per, sum per summer. Um, we, Justin spent quite a bit of time and his, and his group spent time talking about the life cycle and sort of the complications that come with estimating number of generations and a, and a generation time in our first seminar. But um, basically, I would say that they're overlapping. It's really hard to distinguish, especially within the growing season, just because you have adults that are continuously emerging and then moving to fresh plants to find, um, to find uh, places to lay eggs. So... Yeah, we don't know how long they live. The adults, we don't, the generation time is approximately a month, but that's our best guess at this point. All yeah, right. I, I think on the, the lifespan of the adults, I guess to frame it, it it's short. Uh, it's not gonna be long. Um, maybe under, under some control conditions here an observation like five days, that's unlikely in the field. Probably, probably like Theobaldi, maybe down to three or so. so short, but nope, nobody's, like Aaron said, nobody's looked at it, right, to, to know. 
Yeah, and so a, a couple of people have asked about they missed the first webinar uh, last week when you did spend some time talking about life cycle and emergence and duration, and that'll be posted early July. Early July, wow, early March. And so um, either next week or the following week, Phyllis will help us prepare those recordings with closed captioning at the soybeangalmage.org website. So hopefully if you missed last week, you can catch up um, and next week. Okay. Um, I have next uh, a really exciting presentation by a non-entomologist. We thought we would bring in a, an expert talking about host plant resistance and a number of us have been participating in some work evaluating some host plant resistance uh, for potential for management. And so, um, George, I'm hoping that you can bring up your slides and we will move on to talking about um, host plant resistance. We um, will maybe just skip ahead and then come back yeah. to George. Okay, maybe he got kicked off. Um, Gloria and, and Bob, are you ready to talk about biological control? Uh, Gloria and Bob are from the University of Minnesota and uh, they're working on uh, yet another way to potentially suppress soybean gall mitch. So I can see your slides and I can hear you. So take it away. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Gloria Melotu. I'm a master's student from the University of Minnesota. And today I will talk a little bit about biological control for soybean gall mitch. With, I will refer in this presentation as SGM. So I believe that you heard a lot about how to manage soybean gall mitch by now. So I will just point out what we know so far. So resistant varieties of soybean to this pest are unavailable until the moment. Insecticide management appears inconsistent for both foliar applied and seed treatment. And there was no bio research on biological control until now. Okay, but what is biological control? So biological control is the use of living organisms known as natural enemies to suppress pest population. So these natural enemies could be predators, parasitoids, and or pathogens. But today I'm going to talk only about predators and parasitoids. So the objective of my master research is to characterize soybean gomish natural enemy community for the potential biological control in Southwest Minnesota. So my research questions are, what species of predators attack soybean gomish? And what species of parasitoid attack soybean gomish? So to answer these two questions, I will work through two field seasons. So the first one was last summer, and the other one will be this summer. So my field is located in Rock County, Southwest Minnesota in a city called Laverne. So I have two fields with eight locations each. So four in field edges, 15 feet inside the field and four on field interior, 100 feet inside. So I will start talking about the predators part. So to better understand the community of SGM predators, we have three different sampling methods. So soybean plant inspection and sweep to sample for predators on the plant and pitfall traps to sample for predators on the ground. So we went to the field for the first time late June, so 15 days after the first soybean gall midge adult emerged. And then we went every 15 days, having a total of five collection days. So for the plant inspection, we selected 10 plants per location to count, collect and preserve the predators that we found. So we also counted the SGM larvae that we found inside the soybean stem. So for the sweeps, we did 15 sweeps per location in zigzag and then count and preserve the predators. And we had one pitfall trap per location that we deployed for 24 hours. So I have some initial results from this crop season that I want to share with you. For the soybean plant inspection, we did not find many predators, neither diversity between them. It was basically orange insidiosus, the pirate bug that I have here in this photo, and spiders. So in this graph, I have the relative abundance of them across the whole season from the, from in the two fields. And we can see that the percentage of pirate bug was higher than the spiders. 
So I got a total of 59 parrot bugs and seven spiders in plant inspections across the whole season in both fields. Same thing here for the sweeps now. So I have the same type of graph of relative abundance. We did not find many different predators. We just found some leafwing larvae. So for the higher relative abundance was also again of pirate bug. Here are the exact numbers, 107 pirate bugs, 18 spiders, and two lacewing larvae. For the, so this is a photo of one of our pitfall traps after 24 hours. So we got up to 155 of these ground beetles in one pitfall trap. So for the pitfall traps, we were targeting predators from the ground. So we got some different results. The most abundant predator was this ground beetle, a carabidae that's called Terestitius melanarius. And we had some spiders and four other carabidae that I did not identify it yet. So I'm calling them carabidae one to four. So we got a total of 4,345 P. melanarius, more than 90% of the ground predators and then 230 spiders in way lower numbers of other gravity. Okay, so after observing that we had these two most abundant predators, Terestitius melanarius and Aureus insidiosus, the parrot bug, we performed a no choice to say to see if these predators would feed on soybean gomish larvae. So our hypothesis is that they would feed on the larva at the moment that it would leave the plant to pupate on soil. So at its third instar when they are bright orange. So for this first experiment, it was performed with nine replications. So nine petri dishes with one adult of P. melanarius and seven bright orange soybean gomage larvae. And we let the predator feed for 24 hours. So here I have a video of one of them eating an SGF larva. So for our surprise and excitement, all nine beetles fed on soybean gomish larvae. So after one hour of experiment, 65.7% of the lar soybean gomish larvae was consumed. And after 24 hours, 100% of the larvae was consumed. So for Oreos, the experiment was a little different. We had eight replications with one Oreos adult and six soybean gomage larvae, and we let them feed for an hour. So here I have a video of an adult feeding on an SGM larva. This specimen fed on this larva for 20 minutes nonstop. So here we can see the mouth part stepped in the larva. And we observed that five out of eight Oreos fed on soybean gomage larvae. And 12.5% of the larvae died after an hour. So this lower percentage of larvae consumed is likely due to the size of Oreos in relation to FGM larvae, and likely due to their piercing sucking feeding that I showed you in the video. Okay. So how we are going to prove that they feed on SGM larvae on field scenario. So we are going to perform a molecular gut content analysis on the predators that I preserved in our samplings. So in summary, I will dissect these predators and extract their gut. Then I will extract DNA from the gut and perform a real-time PCR to see if I can detect soybean gold mesh DNA on the guts. Okay. So that was the predator's part. So now we are moving to the parasitoid question. To answer this question, we divided our methodology into two parts. So I will tell you the first part now. So this sampling happened at the same time that we were sampling for the predators. So every two weeks, and we had five sampling dates. So we collected injured soybean stems from the field, and we developed emergence cages. So we trimmed the soybean stems that we collected and we placed them into a potting mix layer in our cages. And we kept these cages under control conditions in our laboratory. 
So the parasitic wasps and the soybean gummage adults that emerged were collected daily. The dots that we see inside the red circles in the last photo are SGM adults. And the parasitoids that emerged were identified morphologically and through CO barcoding. So CO barcoding is a technique that uses a small portion of the DNA to identify species. Okay, now I will share with you some initial results of the immersion stages. So first, we have here this graph with the number of stock bingo meat adults that emerged from our cages all season long. So on the x-axis, we have the five collection dates and the y-axis, the total of SGM adults. So we observed a peak of adults emergence, almost 1,200 adults at the third sampling date. So the infestation seemed to be higher between June and July. So regarding the parasitoids that emerged from our cages, we calculated the percent parasites based on the numbers of wasps and soybean gummage adults that emerged from the cages. So at the x-axis, we have the sampling dates and the y-axis, we have the percent parasites. So parasites was low, up to 3%. And this photo here is a parasitoid that came out of, from our cages, an SGM larva, and an SGM adult. Here I have a photo of the wasp. The wasps were morphologically identified by Dr. Elijah Talemus as the genus Hynopias from the family Petigasteri. So Hynopias is a large genus with more than 350 described species, but they are poorly described. And that's why we have a taxonomy impediment and we cannot tell our wasp species. And the insect morphology and the DNA, they don't match any other known species. Okay, and so now we will present the second part of the methodology to answer the parasitoids question. So to be able to prove that the parasitoids that we got from our emergence cages were actually soybean gummage parasitoid, we collected another set of injured stems which we dissected to count SGM larvae. So after counting, we preserved the SGM larvae to see if we can detect wasp DNA on SGM larvae through molecular assay. Okay, so I know that I talked a lot, so I will try to wrap it up here for you. So we discovered that predators occur in soybean fields with soybean gummage infestation in Minnesota. We also know now that the most abundant predators found in soybean fields consume SGM larvae. And we are going to perform molecular assay to confirm that predation occurs in a real scenario. So for the parasitoids, we found a putative parasitoid of soybean gomage. And now we are going to perform molecular assays to confirm if they are soybean gomage parasitoids. So my project is a combination of field and molecular work, so we can answer all the questions about soybean on the natural community. So thank you, and I think that we have time for questions now. Thanks, Gloria. Uh, you have you get the prize for best videos. Those are awesome. Um, I assume, uh, like you're you're seeing the pirate bugs on the plants. That's that's nothing new. But um, we had a question about: Are you seeing some of the carabid beetles ever on the plants, or is it mainly on the ground? Mainly on the ground. We did not find any carabidi when we were doing plant inspection or sweeps or anything like this. Just on the ground. Thanks. Um, I don't see any other questions regarding uh, about biocontrol, but uh, Gloria or Bob, do you want to say anything else before we move on? I think one thing to, to keep in mind, if you can hear me, is, you know, we, we've got some evidence that there are natural enemies that could be helping suppress these populations. So one more reason to think about, you know, insecticide applications and, you know, when and where we really need them because you know those applications are a lot of times with the broad spectrum insecticides that might kill the pest but they're pretty likely going to kill some of these natural enemies too that could be helping with soybean gall midge or soybean aphid or you know other natural or other pests as well 
Yeah, the the wasps might be specific, but the the predators are more generalist. Right. Is that right? So they'd be helping all sorts of pest suppression. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Um, all right, uh, George, we hope that you're with us. You got back from unfrozen internet world. Are you with us? Yes. All right. Um, I'm not sure how much you you heard me say before, but uh, George is a is a soybean breeder from the University of Nebraska, and he'll be talking about some host plant resistance, which is of high interest to many of us. So um, let's see, we see your slides and we can hear you. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll be uh, looking at some preliminary information that we have so far on um, soybean plant reaction to gall midge infestation and all the the hard work was done by these guys who who looked at uh, who did all the evaluations of the plots in the field um, to get the you know the infestation data and the damage scores um, and and then we worked on the the analysis of the genetic information to see if see just what's going on and I'll tell you a little bit about about what we did in the field. So we had, you heard uh, from the previous presentations, you know, the, the infestation is, is most significant on the edge of the field. So that's how we designed our experiment for screening. And really this is the first step and it's really just screening a diverse set of genetic material to see if there is any kind of uh, differential response and any kind of um, thing, part of that response that we can attribute to genetics. And, um, and if it's heritable. So, so we planted plots along the field edge. They were long uh, and narrow. We didn't uh, go more than 50 feet in. And we included in that, uh, it was because we evaluated a large number, over 700 uh, individual genotypes. We had an augmented incomplete block design with uh, smaller uh, incomplete blocks of about 32 entries. And each of those included two common checks, a more resistant check and a more susceptible check uh, from a, a seed company identified by them as, as those things, more resistant and more susceptible uh, that, that Justin had access to. And this is just showing the distribution of the scores um, of those resistant versus susceptible checks. And you can see there is some uh, difference in the, in the average at each location and the overall average. But, um, uh, and so there is some, uh, some differential response. And in our large group of material, uh, we had, uh, you can see in the field, the just neighboring plots, which are small single row plots, uh, big differences in their response. And so with our replication and uh, differences in genotype, we know that that's not just variation in the field. We can attribute that to genotype differences. And this shows a distribution of the gall midge injury scores over 713 soybean germplasm accessions from the USDA soybean germplasm collection. The injury scores were from zero, no injury, to four as 100% uh, plants injured. And injury means wilted or dead plants that are due to infestation. Um, and these were three environments, one in 2020 and two in 2021 at Mead and uh, near Lincoln in Nebraska. They were planted in Iowa and South Dakota, but they didn't have sufficient infestation to get, uh, to get good injury uh, data in 2021. But you can see uh, then with that distribution that um, there is some good news. I mean, the low end of the injury score is on the left side here, zero up to uh, almost four, 3.5 as an average. And those individual plot scores range from zero to four but uh, in a lot of these, but the good news is that the distribution shows a predominance toward more resistance and 40 accessions uh, out of that 700 or so had a mean injury score less than 0.25. So about 12 and a half percent of the plants were injured. Uh, 114 of them with a score less than 0.5 and a, and a really several hundred 
with one or less. So there were only 15 accessions that were that were uh, in excess of two and a half. So that's good news. I think um, even if some of those, you know, even if our scores are generally on the lower end, um, I doubt that, uh, I mean, I think we have a good chance of finding at least a few genotypes that are pretty, uh, that have some kind of level of good resistance. And just to, just to tell you a little bit about that sample, um, the sample that we use, the 700 and uh, more than 700 diverse accessions from the USDA germplasm collection was part of another study that I uh, that we uh, was working with uh, and was leading for the North Central Soybean Research Program uh, with another project. And part of that was, you know, how do we sample the germplasm collection? And we use the genotype information that's available on all those accessions to, to get the most diverse sample. And we look at different sampling methods. And so with with those genotypes, we used that same set of material, because I had seed of all those, we used that same set of material to uh, evaluate in this soybean gall midge screening. And you can see the colored uh, spots, orange, blue, and black represent our, our different samples. And, and we used all of those. So that's the that comprises the whole set of 700 um, or more. And they represent, uh, sorry, they represented the uh, the genetic diversity of the more than 7,000 accessions in maturity groups one through four that you can see represented by the light gray background. So we um, we represented the total genetic variation that's available in the collection of more than um, 20,000 accessions really in the, in the germplasm collection. And so then when we looked at uh, the correlations, you know, the between the phenotype scores that were collected in the field, and all in the genotype information, that 50,000 SNP information, uh, we get this kind of plot that shows us significant regions on different chromosomes. There's 20 chromosomes in soybean, one through 20, and each of these different colors represents uh, the regions along the chromosome. And so we can identify certain uh, DNA segments or sequences that are more highly associated with that phenotype. Um, you know, the, in this case, the, uh, the injury score. And what we found was there's significant single nucleotide polymorphism, there's significant DNA markers um, on all uh, chromosomes except for three of them. So 17 of the 20 chromosomes in soybean have some pretty highly significant uh, associations with, um, with injury score here. Uh, we also wanted to look at elite cultivars. And we didn't, in, uh, for the first year or two, we didn't, we don't have access to a, a broad range of, of commercial cultivars, but we evaluated about 100, over 160 lines that are elite lines in the soybean breeding program here at the University of Nebraska. And, um, and we found a similar kind of um, reaction where most of the scores, there's a predominantly a low injury in the scores. The scores range from one to four on some stuff, but you can see these averages um, go up to about two. And we have a lot of um, ex a lot of elite lines that seem to have a pretty high level of resistance or at least a low level of injury. Um, so that seems to be good news also. Um, and again, these are limited data. It was a lot of work. Uh, Justin had to see a chiropractor, I think the last two years um, for getting just to get all these evaluations. But for in summary, we, we found out that soybean lines show differential response to gall midge infestation and, and that there are genotype differences. So we can attribute uh, at least a, a you know, significant portion of that response to genotype. Um, we map those genomic regions associated with response to gall midge infestation, and we identified significant SNPs, and we'll follow up uh, on those regions to see if we can identify any uh, key uh, genes to focus on uh, that might be causing those um, kind of reactions on the host side, or where, what kind of interactions are going on. Um, so, and there is significant resistance observed in elite soybean germplasm based on our evaluation. So of, of the Nebraska breeding program, which you know, should be somewhat representative of what's in uh, elite germplasm in, in North America in general. 
And that's, that's good news for soybean farmers and companies because they can screen current elite germplasm in both phenotypically and uh, you know, we hope genotypically with the genetic information that we have to identify the best lines for uh, gallmage infested areas and, and maybe um, you know, for use in breeding programs. So uh, I think in general, it's, uh, the outlook is optimistic uh, for a quick re response, you know, most importantly for growers and companies uh, now to get to identify things in their programs. Um, and then follow up with the longer term research that's needed to just get a better handle on exactly what uh, is going on genetically and for the host and, um, and insect interactions and how we can just better uh, get a more um, durable and stable resistance. So thanks to all the sponsors. Thanks to these, uh, all these guys for helping and thank you for uh, your attendance and interest. Thanks, George. Uh, there are a few questions that come in, um, and it quickly brings up my ignorance to, to soybean breeding, but some of the questions are relating to maturity group. I'm wondering if you could speak to the, the things that you've evaluated the past couple of years. Would it represent a range of maturities? Yeah, so we evaluated maturity groups one, two, three, and four, and that's what's adapted in the regions where uh, the insect exists right now. and um, um, we, I can't say too much. Uh, I don't think there's any conclusion that any one maturity is, has more or less resistance than another. Although I, I'm, I didn't show the slide, but in, in that breakout, it looked like, um, there was, you know, it looked like we might have better, um, on, on average, better resistance in, in the earlier stuff. The group four material seemed to be a little bit more susceptible. I had a wider range in, in injury scores, but I, I don't, you know, I don't know what to say about that. We just need to get a lot more information. How do you feel about people planting soybeans on April 10th or April 15th? What's your gut reaction? <laughs> That's <laughs> go for it. I mean, you know, in any decision, you have to consider the whole system. So, um, so there's always trade-offs one way or the other. And I think Justin hit on a lot of those, um, you know. Uh, um, know so. Yeah, it's, it's a, certainly a, a judgment call, but um, I'm, I'm also seeing the trend of people planting soybeans earlier and sometimes they, they opt to do it before planting corn even. They're, they're seeing some of those benefits to yield, but um, a, a lot of the areas that are represented with soybean Gallmage overlap with some really intense drought the last couple of years. I'm wondering how drought might impact some of the host plant resistance screening that we're doing. Uh, or maybe that's, that's a good. Place. I'm wondering the same thing. I don't okay. know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know that would be probably be more. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the things one of the things to point out, I guess, in the genetic side is you notice there's significant. Um, genomic regions on every on 17 of the 20 chromosomes that doesn't you know there's so so much as with any insect or uh, maybe other pathogens um, there's so much involved in the whole process that uh, there may be some key things that are involved in the initial wounding or you know some part of the process or there's other genes that are involved in other parts of the process or some are maybe more general uh, we just don't know right now so um, it doesn't mean that we would need to combine, you know, things from 17 chromosomes to have any kind of level of resistance. But I think the good news, at least what's in the limited phenotype information we have so far, is that, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, at least phenotypically, some, some decent levels of resistance out there. And I think coupled with some of the other management strategies that you guys are coming up with and uh, other good decisions, um, you know, we could at least get through the short term without uh, getting annihilated here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know we're we're uh, it's eleven fifteen, and I just want to make people aware. Um, if you check out the chat box, Phyllis has provided a uh, link for you to get CEUs. We'll also provide a QR code at the end of the session if you want to scan that. It might be a little bit faster, but. 
Um, I don't know if any of the panelists have any kind of follow-up questions for George, as long as we've got them, got them on, on the line here. Uh, I don't know if anything else popped up specifically for breeding or host plant resistance before we just move into like general question and answer. Aaron, you know, one thing I wanted to add to, to George and, and, and this, I think this is one of the, the most exciting things with soybean knowledge in terms of management is this, this future direction. You know, George, we talked, I think 99.9% uh, .9 of all the plots got infested. So nothing of what we're seeing is gonna, uh, doesn't look like it's gonna remove gallmage from the system. So we're, we're still anticipating even on the best case, we're probably gonna have this insect with us. Um, is that safe assessment? Yep. Who are you, who are you I, asking? No, oh. just as a general kind of, kind of from your perspective on what you've seen or, or any comments on that, you know, on what, what the expectation is with, with where we're headed. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, you're the entomologist. I would say, yeah, we're, the insect is here. So, so, yeah. uh, um, it, it'll be, it's a really interesting, um, uh, scientifically, to, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, it does cause significant damage in fields where, uh, for a lot of people, but I think the, the good part is, um, you know, there's a question here, does that imply the variations we see in the field are somewhat related maybe to their variety choice? And yeah, it could be. So, um, so you know, that's one thing that could be useful is just evaluation of commercial um, soybean varieties. But I think probably, you know, whether they'll, they'll uh, let um, a third party do that, or if I'm sure the companies will jump on this and want to provide that information for their own, um, for their own growers, so uh, customers. So, but the good news is they should be able to be, to do that um, and find something, find things that are more, uh, you know, less susceptible to damage, I guess. You, you know, George, when we started tackling this, I, I don't think a single person paid any attention to fissures on soybeans. Like it's just this largely ignored, part of a soybean plant. And we, we didn't take tremendously detailed notes as we went through the germplasm, but I, I don't think a single uh, accession line that we looked at didn't show signs of fissures. Uh, so there's no sources like that, that the fissure looked different, but they're all there. Well, I think, yeah, we talked about it in the group. I think that's one of the things that we'll look, definitely look at uh, in more detail this year. That would be a simple thing, you know, is it consistent? And is there a few genotypes that just don't form fissures uh, below the cotyledon um, or, you know, ones that the, the insect likes. Is that correlated at all with any of the data we have? And we can, I mean, that would, on one side, on the positive side, that would be a really simple fix for, for the short term. Uh, but we do want, you know, some, some other uh, real resistance. And, and so the other things we have to sort out in all this data is, is there some preference uh, going on? And is there there are some real um, antibiotic type of resistance that where where the the larvae are killed um, as they feed on the plant. Yeah, I, I know I've seen in some seed catalogs as far as like pathogens, they might have like low, moderate, high levels of for certain diseases. Um, it would be great to see that for soybean gallmage and maybe other pests in the future to have just kind of like their just real general screenings or predictions for for pest management. Um, do, do any of you other panelists have any questions or thoughts for George? I guess, George, what, what everybody's sitting on is, is what, what happens in 2022 or 20, yeah, you know, this, this coming season, you know, I, I think everybody's wondering how we progress on this. And I, I know that's, that's hard to, to say, but, but maybe your general thoughts on this coming season and, and what we might, we've discussed this a little bit. For the research, you mean? Yes. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, because we do have pretty uh, consistent differences, you know, it's three environments of data and we have things that are way at the low end for injury and way at the high end. So we could, re we don't have to continue to evaluate those 700 or more uh, genotypes and we can uh, gauge. Um, so, so one thing that we talked about is uh, looking at a small group of you know, representing the more uh, susceptible and the more resistant types and maybe uh, initiating those yield tests 
in in the highly infested areas and and then maybe coupling it with some of the other treatments on top of it but it, it pretty you know without too many treatments going on um to see you know if we uh, how good the resistance that we're identifying is uh in the end for yield um and protecting yield and then if anything uh any anything coupled with any of those more simply um uh more simple management strategies could uh help that even further so and one big question i have going forward is if we drop injury score drastically you know like like we're seeing in this the skew towards less injury is how much yield protection are we getting with that and and is there still a gap uh you know when we look to say comparison partially covered with healing you know, and, and yeah, starting exactly. to compare between those two, but it's a long road, but, but a neat, really neat one. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be exciting. Yeah. I think everybody should remember, you know, that this insect was named in 2019 and, you know, there, there's insects that we've been studying for 50 years that we're still struggling with or even longer. So this is very new with respect to everything about the insect and its relationship to the environment and soybeans. So, I think, uh, you know, we've learned some really neat stuff. We're learning more. Um, frankly, I, I was real happy to see some of the natural enemy work and also the breeding work. I mean, that's just wonderful that elite lines and, you know, there's a, we can see a horizon, you know, we can see something in the future coming uh, from this, you know, very early work on this pest. So there's gonna be a lot of more to do. We, you know, for instance, what are the other possible hosts? You know, one thing, there's other insects, you know, we've looked at, uh, you know, the, the sweet clover, but, you know, are there others? If you think about all the legumes that might be out there and other uh, uh, plants and, you know, there are insects that have one of their hosts is like trees or woody plants. So there, there's just a, a lot to do. Um, and I'm glad we're making some of this progress, particularly on the, uh, some of the management side, like the breeding and the, the natural enemy work. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and and thanks a lot, George, for taking time to break down some of the, the jargon and the research. I know I get tons of questions about soybean genetics, and so I feel like I need uh, like a couple more of these just to be a little more competent in soybeans. Um, I think what we'll do now is just transition to kind of open-ended questions. We have a few in the, in the Q&A box that haven't been answered yet. I think uh, Justin's prepared sort of like a summary of session one and session two to help jog your memory if you had some other questions that pop up. But one question that has been kind of asked several times today is the relationship of drought and, and midge, midge success or maybe not success. And I thought maybe we could kind of go around uh, to the different states because I know that drought was, was pretty patchy within a crop reporting district or even a state. So I'm wondering if you could give sort of a, your, your summary thoughts on what part drought played into midge um, activity. Maybe we could start with South Dakota with Adam. How, what was drought like for you last year and how did it affect midges? Oh, hey Adam. I can get everything. It wasn't lined up right. <laughs> <laughs> we see well, ya. Uh, you know, we, we were really dry last year, Aaron, and uh, I know we talked a lot about it during the summer as a group, but we didn't see a lot of sweeping gall midge until later in the summer. And I know we still had some areas that were hit fairly hard, uh, kind of in our routine areas down in the south, more so southeastern part of our state. But overall, we, we had much fewer emergence numbers and uh, just it was hard to find them in the field when we were scouting. And so uh, looking at, you know, the drought monitor map right now already shows that we have areas in South Dakota that are abnormally dry to severe drought. And so we're kind of bracing ourselves, I think, in South Dakota. If we don't see more snowfall or some spring precipitation, it might be a similar year as last year. And so we'll we'll keep an eye on it. But, it, uh, you know, just a hypothesis is what, what might be going on is uh, when you don't have moisture, the plants don't grow as fast. And uh, maybe we just aren't getting those fissures uh, that we would see in a normal year when you have that rapid growth. Things, things took off and were hard looking at the yield uh, from a lot of our studies. 
Uh, it was actually the stuff that was planted a little bit later that did much better this year for yield, which is normally opposite from what we see in South Dakota and other states. Earlier planted soybean tend to yield a little better, but uh, we caught those uh, late late summer kind of early fall rains and that did give us a little yield bump. So that's that's kind of my answer, I guess. Thanks, Adam. Um, let's move to Minnesota with, with Bob and Bruce. What are your impressions? And before you guys say anything, just remember that there's a the CCA link in the chat box and then we'll bring up the QR code if you'd rather scan that in just a second. So Bob and Bruce, what do you think? Well, I can, I can start maybe, Aaron, and, and uh, you know, basically most of the western part of the state, which is where we have, we can find the soybean gall midge most easily, uh, was dry early in the season um, in part of the state that we've seen some heavily infested fields. They had uh, moisture, but it came, and good moisture and good yields, but it came um, later. It started in July, that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if, if that early season dryness affected uh, either the midge emergence or success in, in mating or laying eggs or something like that. But populations were definitely down this year um, statewide field. We went fields we went back to that had been infested in the uh, past, those areas, uh, those numbers seem to be down. Anything else to add, Bob? Uh, no, I think Bruce covered it pretty well. Um, you know, from the bit I know about some other gall midges, I think that moisture is pretty important for some of these key phases of their life cycles. So, um, you know, it, it kind of makes sense that the dry year would maybe knock them down a little bit and then uh, it'll be interesting to see how things play out this year. Yeah. Um, from Iowa, the what I think of like the, the counties, the Western counties that have soybean gall midge is where we had some, a second year of really intense drought, sometimes entering like D2 or D3 doubt, drought with a drought monitor. And so we've had sort of two down years compared to Nebraska. And I, I certainly think that the drought plays a part in their numbers, not only midges, but other pests as well just seem to be sort of down um, in the soybean world. So um, I, I think it has to play a role. And as far as like <clears throat> soil types and all that, we don't really know how, how that plays into their success, but it seems like the prolonged drought is having an effect on, on the midges. But um, there's a couple of representatives from, from Nebraska. What do you guys think? Go ahead, Tom or Bob, if you want to kick it off. Well, you know, we still, in some areas, yes, it seemed like it was reduced some, but we still had those hot spot areas. And there were a couple areas that popped out up here that were kind of, uh, that weren't a problem in the last couple of years, like over by Wayne and, and uh, got worse over by Wakefield. Um, so I wouldn't doubt that there's some role to play with moisture and, and rain events. Um, Justin might speak to that. Some of the work we, you know, some insects, uh, adult emergence is stimulated by um, uh, uh, rain, you know, rain effects. So I bet there's a, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a relationship, but the pest was still there um, in pockets and in certain areas and persisted. So um, if there's an effect, there may be effect, but not something to really depend on unless you're in the high dry areas regularly. River bottoms, you know, some of there's a couple places I've gone back to that have been kind of low in river bottom areas or creek bottom areas. And it seemed to still be an issue in those, those places. Yeah, I, I don't know how much I have to add to the, the discussion on this. You, we were a little bit under, I think, when we started off the season. We March, we had a bunch of rain and then things got dry for like a month or two below normal and then caught up in, in June and then dropped off again. I'm sure that varied across the state for depending on where you were exactly. Um, you, you know, Galmage, uh, unfortunately for growers, seemed to do fine uh, through through that period and, and through conversation. You know, I, I think it has done okay in years that are dry, but, but I think the, the hard part of this is, is this insect is in last year's soybean field that, that is corn this year and corn grows fairly quickly relative to soybeans. We get canopy closure and this insect is somewhat protected in its emergence being, as long as that corn is growing well, you know, it's, it's, it's got a nice environment underneath that corn. We walk those fields to check cages. Our, our legs get soaked every morning, most mornings. Um, and so, you know, and then when it moves over to soybean, the same thing, they eventually 
you know, canopy closure. And, and so it, it seems to do okay. You know, uh, Tom, you mentioned the, the studies and we did one last year where we added water to cages in an attempt to see if it would, you know, create uh, more emergence in those cages or get more. Uh, we got numerical differences just a few days after those, like three to four days after we got this bump. Um, but, but I mean, all of us, Tom, Aaron, you know, Aaron, I, I think uh, Bruce and, and Adam in 2019 and 2020, my lab got a significant amount of like the jitters after a rainstorm going out to check cages, because we, we had seen with a rainstorm, a kind of a surge and emergence that followed. And then just, just so Gallmage, so we don't learn anything quick enough, it reversed itself in 2021 here in, in Nebraska, at least, and you get a rain and they'd shut off. Um, and so, so we just, we just don't know enough. Um, but I know talking with, um, you know, our, our chemical ecologist that has recently joined the university in Kesey, you know, these, these insects are pretty good at detecting water. And so maybe that's driving some of their movement in the landscape, you know, with, with an abundance of water or lack thereof, just, just too many unknowns. That's my two cents. Yeah. And with a lot, and with insects, you know, the the microclimate is what is really important. So, is is you know, you can see some general things and dryness and whatnot, but what is the microclimate in which that insect operates? And this, uh, so there's a lot to learn about this insect yet. We had one really good question that talked about, you know, we 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 mentioned a few times that they seem to be the worst at the field edge or they're most intense, likely from the overwintering movement to new soybean and talked about maybe some tactics we could use, maybe even site specific where we're targeting seed treatments or tillage or other other maybe tillage uh, or sorry, tilling. Um, do you think that is just going to push midges into the field interior faster if we do something like that? I think certain things, you know, just a guess, if you're doing certain things on the edge that um, do not affect uh, the adult, well, then I imagine the adult will behave as normal and just kind of, if it's going to be mostly on the edge and if it's a populations that won't initially go deep, then, then, then that wouldn't have as much effect. If you're affecting the behavior of the adult, like, you know, blocking its path to overposition, it might just keep dispersing, you know, diffusion moving through that area into the field. If it's, and if it's a, you know, or are you just affecting the larvae, you know, say with seed treatment or something. So it depends. There is a potential for it just to move that front in the field. I do know when we looked at, we looked at thymet on the field edge up here in Link, up here over by uh, Wakefield, we had 24 rows of thymet and then, uh, you know, 200 foot row plots. And we took our readings, you know, in the middle of the plots. And uh, we went to the edge and it did look like thymet was, you know, it wasn't just pushing them past. It was a lot lower there, even when we went into the beans that weren't treated. But there were, you know, again, that was, we didn't have great infestation. So the numbers, while they were different, um, there was no difference in yield anywhere in the field and, and things like that. So, so you know, there, if, and, and in that case, it's just affecting the um, adults. I mean, the, the larvae, probably, the thymet. And so, you know, they seem to kind of go into the edge a bit and that was it. So it just depends on what type of strategy you're using. And then we have to look at it to see. Because I, you know, insects sometimes move by uh, basically simple diffusion. So they just kind of keep moving along. And so, you know, in that case, they could move past a zone like that. Yeah. It, from observations in Nebraska, if, if there were two things that concern me about practices we could do that could dry this insect, further into the field unintentionally. One would be hilling because we don't know the result of hilling and, and impact on behavior. And the other would be shifting planting dates between the outside of the field border and the inside. You know, planting the outside later uh, could, could cause them to go further into the field if in fact size of plant is a factor. Um, and so, so those are two that, that would, would really concern me in trying, you know, that, that we, could, we could upset and push them into the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They're very attuned to that pounce stage. So you have to keep, be aware of that. I think it would be fair to say we're, we don't have a, a cultivar summary of like resistant or susceptible either through Georgia's work or available through industry yet. Is that, is that right, Justin? There's not like a place you could go to look at the screening evaluations that we've done. 
unless George has one in his back pocket, he's not sharing with the rest of us. Yeah, I don't think there's okay. anywhere to go. <laughs> We're not no, going there. I, I, no, we don't have access to any. Yeah. Uh, any but our own, so I don't have okay. any. Okay. Um, has anyone specifically looked at row spacing, um, like narrow 15, 30 inch rows, if that helps or hurts the midges? Took a shot in the dark at it in, what was that, 2020 uh, at, at NREC. Um, and I, please others comment if you've done other things. You know, all of our studies go in in 30s because it's easier to get through plots and uh, we're not set up for 15s. But we did plant a 30s, 15s, and seven and a halfs just by offsetting the planter each time. Super fun to plant, by the way. Um, but, you know, we saw infestation regardless of, of which one of those was used. And I, I think this relates to another question, which is plant population, you know, and, and we'd had that conversation earlier and Natasha Yumezi is looking at reflection of that, which is stem diameter. Um, but I, I, we didn't see anything like stark and contrast where it's like, oh yeah, reduce row spacing. Here's the response. I, they all got infested um, mm -hmm. and wasn't apparent changes were, were occurring, but it probably needs to be looked at more closely. Yeah, I found them all in all, but however, maybe we can include that in a, uh, this year we're gonna do continue our survey. And so incorporate that as one of our observations if we haven't already. I think we recorded it some, it wasn't in a lot of them, but you know, just generally I found them in, in all so far. Yeah, I agree with Justin. Our, our research is set up to be 30 inch rows so that we can walk around, but when we were doing transect surveys, uh, we talked about it last week, you know, in commercial fields, you see every type of scenario. And I think it'd be fair to say you could see soybean gall midge in all, all setups. Yeah. Um, have, uh, one question we had was related to soil and air temperatures and rainfall events. Has anyone, maybe Justin, have you looked at, at anything more specifically when it comes to temperature and rainfall? You know, Aaron, I think the best shot we took at it was with Mitchell when he started in, in, in Iowa, where he, he got, you know, to a site and tracked temperature very closely. Uh, and, and I think through that process, we, we found it in the literature wasn't looking too great uh, for, for this, you know, genus seems to have a wide variation. Uh, I think it was five to nine days on either side uh, with temperature. Um, I think we did take a rough stab at uh, generations when we had a, a good separation of them in 2019 and we were picking up a consistent degrees of freedom or degrees of freedom, uh, degree days uh, change to each generation. But we, we lost confirmation of that as soon as we got these overlapping generations you mentioned earlier. Um, and then the rainfall, I, we've looked a little bit into that. So Aaron, I don't know if you have to, what the, you have stuff to add because you were working directly with Mitchell on that um, temperature. Yeah, I mean, uh, their maturity or their development from egg to an adult would be predictable based on accumulating degree days. And to know that more, more accurately is it would only be known as if we could get a colony going because we can do all kinds of temperature loggers and that in the field, but really it's a highly variable outside. And so to get something that's really accurate, we need to have a colony and um, unfortunately, we haven't been successful at doing that because that just launches a whole no another level of research when it comes to um, responses to treatments, uh, biological control, many other things I think would be uh, benefited from a colony. And, and we're working really hard on that, but it's, it's, it's not as easy as it is for some other insects. So hopefully by this time next year, we can say we have a colony going. <laughs> um, Let's see, we just have a few more questions and we might just wrap it up in the next couple of minutes. So again, if you if you have trouble with the link, let us know. Hopefully everyone that needed the QR code could successfully scan it. Um, uh, do you know if anyone has um, data that has like continuous soybean um, as far as impacting midges, soybean on soybean, if say if they don't wanna grow corn or another crop? I've, I've had a feel that was, uh... Uh, soybeans for several years that we did work in and, you know, thinking that, boy, it's going to really ramp up and ramp up and ramp up. And yeah, we always had them in that field, but it, it, the pattern was kind of this year a lot, next year, not so many. And this year a lot, you know, so it, we didn't see a pattern and a, particularly a ramping up. It was, uh, you know, they had them every year, but 
no real pattern at, at up by Randolph. I don't know. I think Justin for sure had some experience with uh, soybeans on soybeans too. So, you know, uh, I remember really clearly, Aaron, our conversation the one year about soybean on soybean and just the difference between Iowa and and Nebraska. Uh, we, I had a grower. He's probably even on this call. Say, uh, you know, I'm just going to give you this field and plant it back to soybean, assuming this insect is just going to wipe this field out. Um, and you can you can learn the research need, and that reflects the growers and their their uh, willingness to let us uh, learn things at their expense. And what surprised me and the grower uh, was the the lack of pressure in that field. It was one of the lowest pressured fields. Now, uh, I I think that's a good transition to Aaron, who you know it, it, quite a bit different in Iowa. It, it may also yeah. be a difference. We didn't know much about varietal selection or, you know, the planting date, things like that. So it was early on. So there's other things that could come in there too. Yeah, yeah my experience was a field in Southwest Iowa that a farmer let me use and he had planted it to soybean in 18. Noticed a lot of midge problems and let me plant soybean in there in 2019. And the field was completely wiped out and replaced by weeds. And for some reason, he let me work in the field. <laughs> he worked on that on his farm the following year. So that situation, the soybean on soybean was a really bad one. And so um, it's been sort of variable. Um, but then since 2019, the pressure has been really, uh, it's been dampened. And it almost seems like the pressure on his farm is dispersed. So it's not really intense on the field edges anymore. It's more um, into the field interior. So that behavior has sort of broke down and I'm not sure if it's because he did the two years of soybean. I'm not sure why, but he never never really had that kind of pressure again. I don't know if it's drought or variety selection. I'm not sure. You, you know, Aaron, uh, with all the comments that people have made, it, it really makes you think about this. We, we appreciate those because uh, it's not just answering the question, but, but rethinking what we know so far uh, one thing that with soybean here is it it canopies much later, and and if if that environment open and exposed is hard on this insect, then perhaps Iowa's difference was maybe a wetter year that in in nineteen when when you did that. So, I mean that's something we could look at is is was that soybean on soybean driven by more conducive environmental conditions at a, at adult emergence. I don't know. We don't know the unless you can remember nineteen. I can't remember early last year, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's so variable. The pattern hasn't emerged for me yet. Um, the, the years have been quite different. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone else has observations. Okay, we just have a few more questions. Has have, have any of you tried a trap crop? Um, you know, sort of like. Um, making that area super attractive and maybe burning it down or mowing it down or whatever to eliminate like first and second generation within the summer. I know we've had a lot of conversations and Bruce has been kind of, I think, a leader on, on bringing this topic up as, as an idea. Um, and, and I think there's potential there. I saw one of the questions was related to like sweet clover and planting sweet clover. Um, and, and, oh man, what a loaded question, because we just don't know enough about the host interactions, whether or not one's more attractive than the other. Um, and, and I don't know if growers want to plant their borders to sweet clover, uh, sure would be entertaining driving around seeing sweet clover all on the edges of fields. Um, but I, I'm going to push over to Bruce because he's, he's really kind of pushed this a lot. Well, I, I don't know about sweet clover in particular. Um, and like you mentioned, we don't know which, which host is more attractive and you might actually make problems worse um, by, putting a, by putting a better host in the border if you can't control it. And the other problem with sweet clover is if it goes to seed, it's there for, for a long, long time. So, um, but I think there, there might be, some, there might be some, uh, some options with trap cropping and it might be in the field they're emerging from or in the field they're going to, but but there's a lot of work that has to be done. We don't have any real good answers or firm answers on that yet. Yeah, I got, I got a note that it sounded kind of weird here than normal. I'm not sure if I still do. Still do. Yeah, still do, Aaron. I, I can hit that last question that's on there, which is, 
has replanting been uh, economical? Like, could could we replant a field that was hard hit, uh, or or would the gallmage just re you know infest those newly planted uh, fields just as bad? Um, and a neat question. I, I have my own thoughts. I'm going to toss it off to everybody else first. Their thoughts. Um, what, well, with the long emergence of this midge, you know, just continuous emergence, um, you know, I I. I I think they could infest those plants readily um, if they got a start in that field. And then we've seen that tillage doesn't do much. If you're just planting into it again, um, they're set up to come out right there when those beans are coming up. So it'd be something to look at, but I tend to think that it wouldn't be a lot of help because they're already there then and they haven't moved off. It just depends, you know. Yeah, Tom. I think if you if you if you did that, you'd have to take those re, uh, re, replant those fields before before those larvae got far enough along to get close to pupating. You'd have to do yeah. do that replanting pretty early after the initial infestation. Other other thoughts on that? You know we. The lab on our transect of checking cages drove by some uh, winter wheat to soybean fields, double double cropped in season, so planted around July 1st. And they were interesting to us because the soybeans were planted so late. Um, and so we snuck out and took a look at the two fields we had. Both were infested, planted after July. Um, and, and if you look at emergence, uh, as well as you know what, what was seen with, with Bob Cook's data of where they pulled them out of the field, there's a lot that happens tail end of July, early August. And, and so with a big population, you know, I think the question is, do they leave fields to new fields uh, or in the field that was replanted, how much that population might reemerge right back onto that late planted soybean? I, I, I wouldn't push it as a strategy um, because it, it feels like it would be a scenario where they, they might have a lot of advantage. If I was going to perpetuate a large population, that's what I would do. So don't do what I do. <laughs> because that, that typically, you know, if I'm doing research, I want to amp up the problem. That's something I might try to, to, to keep the population um, going. Um, but just, just my thoughts on, on and observations on that. Um, I think there was one other one, Aaron, that, that got asked a couple of times. So we've been kind of skipping past it is a couple of people have asked about stem fissures and, and nutrient, um, you know, fertilizer fertility. Uh, so I want to open that up to the group for just really quick. Well, it'd be interesting to really explore, you know, what causes, you know, fissure, you know, what uh, not causes it because so far we've seen pretty much everything uh, have fissures, but can you reduce it or delay it or, you know, what affects fissuring would be an interesting question to explore. Uh, pretty much everything I see, you know, over a very variety of conditions and different fields has beans that have fissures, but I'm not, I don't really know the physiology, be, but enough about the physiology behind that to talk about it, but it'd be, I think it'd be interesting to explore. Maybe narrow a window or, you know, Maybe it could have some effect. Yeah, I know in the greenhouse we've been fighting to to get those fissures to produce normally in a greenhouse, and and we've we've actually gone to heavily fertilizing those to get a little bit better cracking, uh, so that that doesn't bode well for for you know adding more fertilizer could cause um, more cracking, but but a pretty unexplored space I think. Um, yeah, so I can. Thank you all for coming uh, and, and sticking around. You know, it's always impressive to see uh, 140 or more people, you know, hang around for, for almost two hours uh, listening to us uh, talk back and forth. We appreciate your questions. This, this informs us going forward. It's not, not a mute point when you ask these questions. We, we, we can generate research from this. Um, and and I, I think all of us um, have, have enjoyed a lot of the conversation. I'll, I'll add just this reminder, because uh, Aaron is, is uh, keeping me on track with all the things to mention, is that we have an evaluation. Please fill out that evaluation. It's so important to us. You know, if we do this next year, uh, there's things you liked or didn't like. We, we want to know so we can format this a little bit differently that, that you know, might be useful for, for all of us. So uh, take, take the time to fill it out. That's, that's really important to, to how we look at this. Um, going forward. Is from the group anything we missed before we 
We end. Thank you, Phyllis, again. Matt, I don't know what this would look like with, without you, so we, we really appreciate uh, all, all you've done uh, in putting this together. Final comments? Anything missed? All right, feel free to, to get a hold of us. You got other questions or, or comments? Thanks, everyone. Ciao.